A new study was just published in geology that poses an interesting question. What causes more erosion, an ice age or modern agriculture? You might think that giant glaciers scraping across the landscape would win hands down. I mean, how can human actions rival that of global geological processes? But actually, the new data in this study suggests that we might just. And this has major implications for not only the future of sustainable agriculture, but also global climate. Because as I've talked about in many of my videos, weathering and erosion rates heavily affect Earth's climate. So in this video, we'll go through the methods, the results, and significance of this new study. From the last glacial maximum to the present, we'll unpack how modern agriculture is reshaping landscapes faster than an ice age. So before we jump right into the study, why does this matter? Why should we care about erosion rates? Well, soil erosion affects farming, crop quality, water quality, ecosystem health, human health, nutrient cycling, even global climate. And this is because topsoil, the organic rich top layer of soil, which is vulnerable to erosion, is where microbes break down plant litter and store carbon, it stores water, it provides nutrients to plants, and without it, the water and carbon get released to the atmosphere. They contribute to greenhouse warming. And these nutrients just go into runoff, ultimately getting transported all the way to an ocean basin that is already over nutrified in modern settings, causing oxygen depletion in the water column and detriment to marine ecosystems. Also, without topsoil, crops can't get the nutrients they need to grow. So we just pour in more fertilizers, do more tilling, ultimately in this positive feedback loop or cycle, causing more and more erosion and more need for these processes that cause erosion. But I have a whole video about this process, which is called desertification. If you want to check out more about that process, specifically how it's affecting carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. But for today, let's get back to this new study. For decades, scientists have known that Euro-American agriculture, especially since the 1850s, has caused a massive increase in erosion rates, specifically across the US, but likely pretty much everywhere in which these practices are taking place. However, what we haven't yet done is quantify exactly how this human-caused erosion compares to natural caused erosion by geological processes like, say, an ice age, glacial erosion. And that's where this study comes in. The authors of this study used a combination of cosmogenic beryllium-10 geochemistry and optically stimulated luminescence, or OSL, to determine average erosion rates over the last 30,000 years and ultimately compare those during the peak of the Ice Age to those today. But before we get into their major findings, what the heck are these words I just said? What are these wacky cosmogenic and optically stimulated luminescence techniques? And what rocks did they use them on and why? Well, they carried out these geochemical analyses on sediments from Trout Creek, a small tributary in southeastern Minnesota. They chose this location because it was not covered in glaciers during the last glacial maximum. So it preserved layers of sediment in ancient river floodplain terraces, which are essentially time capsules of eroded material from the time they were deposited. The authors of this study sampled three terraces, one 22 feet above the modern floodplain, deposited during the peak of the last glacial maximum around 32 to 20,000 years ago, a second one eight feet above the modern floodplain, deposited during the deglaciation period or during glacial retreat around 28 to 14,000 years ago. And of course, the modern river floodplain deposited over the last 14,000 years. But wait, how do we know the ages of these sediments? I've talked about how we geochemically date rocks using radioactive isotopes on this channel many times. And every time I do, I specify that for geochemical dating like this, the rocks must be igneous to get their original age of formation when they crystallize from whatever magma or lava they formed from. Or they have to be metamorphic if you want to get the age or date of metamorphism but they cannot be sediments or sedimentary because all of the grains that go into sedimentary rocks are an amalgamation from different sources. And so all the grains would give you different ages. But what if I told you there was a way to determine the depositional age of sediments and sedimentary rocks? 
In other words, when they were deposited or buried. You guys, I kid you not, this next bit blows my mind. This is where the author's use of cosmogenic beryllium-10 and optically stimulated luminescence, or OSL, come into play. Minerals, especially quartz, near Earth's surface trap electrons in their crystal lattice over time due to background radiation from the surrounding soils and cosmic rays. This is just because radiation knocks electrons around out of their normal positions or valence shells, and this leads to these electrons getting trapped in a way in structural defects within the mineral's crystal lattice. And these traps are metastable states, meaning that when exposed to enough energy, heat, or light, the electrons escape. However, if the mineral is beneath Earth's surface and buried under soil or sediment, it's not exposed to enough light for the electrons to escape, so they can stay there and continue building up for thousands of years. And because these electrons continue building up in the crystal lattice at known constant rates over time as the mineral is buried near our surface, we can estimate the depositional age of that sediment when it was deposited or buried by purposely exposing these mineral grains to light, optically stimulating them, and measuring how much luminescence is emitted when the electrons are released. The amount of light or luminescence emitted tells us how long it's been since that grain was last exposed to sunlight, which is essentially the time it was deposited. And fun fact, I actually worked in an OSL, an optically stimulated luminescence lab for a USGS internship many summers back, and it was so cool. Because we couldn't expose any of the sediment to light before getting it back to the lab and preparing it completely for analysis, we had to take extra careful measures when collecting and preparing the sample. And because quartz is the best thing in the sediment to do this method with, you have to isolate the quartz from the rest of the sediment, meaning you have to start with acid digestion to get rid of the carbonates and the organics in the sediment, then magnetic separation to get the iron rich minerals out and separate those from like feldspar and quartz, which is what you wanted to keep. And then you had to separate the feldspar and the quartz. And to do that, we actually used heavy liquid and density differences of the minerals and then froze the feldspar with liquid nitrogen and then took out the quartz from that. It was such a process, all while having to work in a dark lab because no light could hit the samples or else we would lose those electrons that we want to measure. So we had to work completely only with red light because red light is low enough energy, it doesn't cause those electrons to escape. And it was very dark and very hard. <laughs> So anyway, that's my fun fact and why I think OSL geochemistry is so cool. But now what about that cosmogenic beryllium-10 stuff? What, what does that mean? Well, this is a very similar concept to OSL. Beryllium-10 is a rare isotope that forms when high-energy cosmic rays collide with atoms near Earth's surface. And over time, just like the electrons we were talking about with OSL, beryllium-10 builds up in quartz material near Earth's surface. The longer the sediment is buried near the surface, the more beryllium-10 it collects. So by combining OSL and beryllium-10 methods, the authors of this study were able to estimate erosion rates over tens of thousands of years. And they found that the difference between natural and modern human-caused erosion was not just noticeable, it's staggering. During the peak of the last glacial maximum from around 32 to 20,000 years ago, when this region was a cold, dry tundra landscape with permafrost and sparse vegetation making slopes vulnerable to frost-based erosion, the estimated erosion rates were from 0.069 to 0.073 millimeters per year. Then during the deglaciation period from around 28 to 14,000 years ago, when when permafrost was melting and glaciers were retreating, erosion rates surprisingly slowed down to around 0.049 millimeters per year. 
The authors suggest that this was possibly due to more stable sandstone slopes compared to glacial luss slopes. Luss is a windblown dust that's common in dry glacial landscapes. So that's possibly why erosion rates were higher during the peak of glaciation compared to during deglaciation. But then the modern sediment deposited from 14,000 years ago to present, which has been characterized by the return of forests, wetter climates, and more vegetation to stabilize slopes, indicated an average erosion rate of around 0.053 millimeters per year. So even with the wild swings of widespread glaciation and deglaciation, erosion rates remained relatively low, at least until humans showed up. Post-settlement erosion rates after Euro-American agriculture began jumped to 0.6 millimeters per year on average, with some areas hitting 3.69 millimeters per year. In other words, modern agricultural erosion rates are 8 to 12 times higher than anything seen in the past 30,000 years. And all of this is just another indication that we've entered the Anthropocene, a time in which humans rival geologic processes in altering Earth's surface. Earth's climate, nutrient cycling, ecosystem health, habitats, you name it. But there is one thing that humans are doing to affect global geologic processes that rivals even these erosion rates, and that is plastic. But the good news is there are researchers out there that are looking into how plastics and microplastics are affecting the environment and ecosystems. And if we can understand that better, maybe we can mitigate those harmful effects a little bit better. So if you're interested in this topic, I have a video coming out soon where I'll be interviewing experts about microplastics in the environment. So keep an eye out for that and I'll see you guys there. Bye.